This is an example of internal uh, consistency. Here is a data record associated with a specimen. Okay, and you can see it's from the California Academy of Sciences. It's a bird. Its catalog number is 96,773. <coughs> it's documented by a preserved specimen. It was collected in 2008. The country was the US. It's in California. That field is not showing. It was from Marin County, California. And it's from this place called San Rafael Hill in San Rafael. And it has these coordinates. Okay? And so we can very easily plot those coordinates and see whether those coordinates fall in the US. Right? If they fall in Zimbabwe, we have a problem. We can see whether they fall in California, and we can see whether they fall in Marin County. Okay? So that's essentially taking one part of the data record, the coordinates, and checking them against another part of the data record, which is the textual description of the locality. And that's a very powerful thing, and oftentimes we can do it in an automated fashion for thousands of specimens. Again, I'll show you examples. And that's very important because it looks for inconsistencies within the data record, which should tell us that something's wrong. Okay? And you do have situations where borders move or names change. I tried to do something with districts in Kenya a couple years ago, and that was a that was a pretty nightmarish situation because all of the districting uh, has changed in the last few decades. On the external side, we have a lot more resources. So this is something that uh, Arturo will talk with you about, but this is, this is just an illustration where we can look at external sources. So here are two different authorities, the International Ornithological Congress World Bird Names version 3.05 versus Clement's sixth edition. And so each of these is the beginning of the bird taxonomy list. And right away, the first thing you see, here's ostrich, which Clement's considered to be one species, but the IOC considers to be two. And so if you say, oh, I just saw a Struthio camelus, under this concept, that looks this big, geographically. The bird is even bigger. Um, you know, it's much of Africa. And under this concept, it's less because this other, uh, it looks like a northeastern African Ostrich is considered a separate species. So we have these resources available to us. And, I want to, and here's another page from late in the, um, in the data set. This is, this is a taxonomic data set, not an occurrence data set. But I wanted to give you this one example of Reichard's seed eater. You can see in this taxonomy, it's on, under Crithagra. And in this taxonomy, it's under Cyrenus. Okay, these are little yellow birds. Um, and you can see under this taxonomy, it's one rather inclusive species, Ricardi. But in this taxonomy, it's two species, Ricardi and Gularis. So imagine now I'm doing a query on African Sirens. And look at this. I've got Cyrenus Ricardi, and I've got Cyrenus Gularis Ricardi. And many times what we do is just ignore the subspecies. And so I've now got two species. But you guys know that those are actually two different versions of the same taxon. One recognized as a species, and one recognized only as a subspecies. So, I'm going to see this only if I'm referring to that external data source. 
And there are, for birds at least, there are lots of online resources. For plants and insects, you get into more and more trouble very easily. We can look at consistency with other records of the same species. So for example, here's a swallow, Hirundo angolensis, and these are, these are records in a, in a gridded sense of the species. And notice that it's kind of a middle belt across Africa. <coughs> okay, and there are some vertnet records of Hirundo angolensis, which fit reasonably closely to the previous data set. <coughs> but here's a GBIF query. Look at these. Those Southern African records. What does that mean? I don't know. But I'm just saying that that query produces results that disagree with the independent data sources, the external data sources. Maybe they're right. Swallows can fly very well. Maybe they migrate. I don't know. But if I were looking for problem records, I'm going to focus on those records. Here's a, uh, an oriole in Mexico, not your family Oriolidae, but the birds that look just like Oriolids when Europeans got to the New World. And so they called them Orioles, um, but they're in a completely different family. <laughs> Um, and you can see some typical features of biodiversity data. Um, the density of records is much higher in the U.S. than in Mexico, just because the density of bird watchers is much higher. And then where do U.S. birders go but to beach resorts when they go to Mexico? So lots of records in Mexican beach resorts. But what I wanted to show you here is that we can also look at these data with respect to environment. And so I think this was, this was um, with respect to annual mean temperature. These are the main bulk of the records of that species. And then I've got this record that's an outlier in this direction, and this record that that's, that's an outlier in that direction. Doesn't mean it's wrong. But you sure ought to look at those records, because those are outliers. They don't fit the pattern for that species. Maybe they're right. Maybe those are really the limits of tolerance of the species. But it's worth looking at them. And then this is one of my favorites. Um, for the last quarter century, I've been involved in a project called the Atlas of Mexican Bird Distributions. Um, it's a database that summarizes the, content, the contents of 80 plus natural history museums. The data were all compiled by hand by two colleagues and me. It's been a quarter century. We still haven't published the project. Um, but the data set includes almost every bird specimen ever collected in Mexico. Um, we quit when I traveled all the way to Moscow to work in the collections at Moscow State University. And traveling halfway around the world, they had six specimens. And we said, let's stop. Um, but this is an interesting thing we could do once we had all those data together in one place. So what we did was we took several of the most productive collectors in the history of Mexican ornithology, and we compiled all of their specimens, and we put them in order by date. Okay? So, you know, Kate was collecting here one day, and then moved camp two miles down the road and was collecting here the next day, and then a week later was 100 kilometers away, etc. Okay? And we measured the distance on the surface of the Earth using that formula, which is not much better than a Euclidean distance. But here's an example for a very interesting personality in Mexican ornithology. Between 
2 October 1955 and 10 October 1955. So on the 2nd of October, he was up north. This is the west coast of Mexico. By the 5th, he had moved down to here, and you see him collecting lots of specimens on the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th. So he clearly was spending time, that's the state of Nayarit, okay? But then, uh-oh, on the 8th, it looks like he collected a bird here, moved very quickly four states away, and then by the 9th came back. Or he made a mistake in his data, or in the case of this collector, it could very easily be that there were some uh, modifications of data. He had a little problem with stealing specimens from other institutions and relabeling them. <laughs> um, but using, you can use this technique only if everybody else has put their data out there for you and everybody to see. If we had only had, you know, the, the Phillips specimens at the University of Kansas where I work, we would only see a tiny piece of his overall itinerary. But because in this, in the case of Mexican birds, we assembled by hand over 25 years all of those records of Phillips and all the other collectors, or now, because we are sharing our data, if and when we get to the point where all of the data for the, you know, the bigger barrier around the world and the local and national herbaria are all in there integrated, we'll then be able to put together all of the specimens that you know, Kate collected over her lengthy career as a botanist. Um, but you can only do this with those external data, okay? Those data that are beyond a single data record. This data record on its own is completely consistent. It's a bird that should be in Guerrero, that state. It's in the right place, it's in the right environments, the right date. But when I saw that it was collected by the same collector on the same day as a specimen from four states away, I know that something's wrong. I don't really know what. Maybe all of these specimens are wrong and that one's right. Or maybe the date is wrong. Maybe he collected it on October 24th and not October 8th. Or, the geographic coordinates are wrong. And so we did this for the top 10 collectors in Mexican ornithological history, plus, let's see, Adolfo Navarro, my colleague of 25 years, and me. And the funny thing was, using this technique, we found errors in all of the historical collectors and both of the modern collectors, both of the authors of the paper, we detected problems in our own data using this technique. But again, this is <coughs> one very solid argument for sharing data, even when there are still errors in the data. So here's Adolfo's data, and we found uh, between two, probably two um, errors in his data. Uh, here's Alan Phillips, um, who is the person I gave you the example from. Um, and so, you know, you can, you can see different error rates, but again, no data set is ever error free. So even the data collected by the authors of the paper had problems in it. Okay, so we're going to talk in the next couple hours about data cleaning, but we ought to talk about what comes next. This is kind of something that Jean brought up during our introductions. What do we do after when we're 
wanting to use our data or publish our data, share our data. So very crucial things, and this is not necessarily so crucial for this, the, the practicum of this course, but rather for the broader lesson. We need to think about field level uh, descriptors of quality. And so one very common thing for spatial data is to provide a radius of uncertainty. Okay, there are, this is, this is the approach that's being used presently. Some of you have met John Wachorek. Um, John essentially implemented this system for biodiversity informatics. But the idea is you give an associated, you give the coordinates of the place, which are that number and this number, but you also give kind of a maximum uncertainty radius, which is, I don't know exactly where the point is, but I know it's within 10 kilometers of this place. Okay? And that is a, a quality designator. It's essentially saying, you know, if the uncertainty radius is one meter, it's pretty high quality. And if the uncertainty radius is a thousand kilometers, it's a pretty bad um, quality record. And to be honest, we've been doing this sort of thing for a long time. Here's a specimen in the collection that I curate. curate. You remember Alan Phillips, the guy who was in two different states at once on the 8th of October, 1955. Here he is, really interesting. In 1973, he looks at that specimen. And in 1976, he looks at that specimen. And so he's saying, if this is some subspecies that begins with W, it's a very bright or brilliant variant. And then later on, three years later, he comes back and he says, this is a big adult Brewster eye, but the back resembles minor, which is to say this man even was arguing with himself, but he was expressing uncertainty about the taxonomy. He's pretty sure that it's Loxia curvirostra, and it is. But which subspecies, he wasn't sure of. And see here, you can see the original label, and you can see a new label with a new determination. 